Before we get started, guys, I just want to thank you all for tuning in. And if you could, please hit that like and subscribe button because it is what allows us to continue to make this kind of content. So thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you guys enjoy. So this is what I brought you guys here today to see. This, what I'm holding right here, is a false water cobra. This is one of the largest colubrid species on the planet and definitely one of the largest in South America where they're from. They are colubrids. They are not true cobras like the name might suggest. I've kept this species for probably three years now or more. And I've noticed over the past year, there has been quite the buzz, quite the activity on different internet groups and in different videos and things. I have seen people falling in love with this species that I have been working with now for a few years, Hydrodynastes gigas. One of their other common names is the Brazilian smooth snake. You might hear them referred to, but honestly, false water cobra is fitting and the coolest name and probably the one you'll hear them referred to by the most besides their scientific name. The name would suggest that they live in the water. That's a little bit of a misnomer. A lot of people, when they keep them in captivity, keep them too wet. They do love the water. Having a water feature that they can get all the way into is very important, but you definitely shouldn't have it like, like a water snake. Like semi-aquatic. They really, really do need some dry land space as well. And they do suffer from humidity sores very easily if you do not keep them like that. The other part of their name, Cobra, <clears throat> is also somewhat of a misnomer. So they're not really, really water snakes and they're definitely not cobras. That being said, they do superficially look like a cobra and they are venomous. And more importantly, the single feature that makes them appear to be cobras the most is that right there, that beautiful, hood. Do you see that? That is their warning system, their defensive system. They spread it just like a cobra would spread their hoods. But one of the notable differences between them and a true cobra is they don't stand up. They won't stand up and look at you the way a cobra will. They fan out to the side, kind of like how you would see a hognose snake. In fact, the behavior is almost identical between them and a hognose snake. The question everyone's probably wondering, are they venomous? The answer is indeed yes, they are venomous. However, they're not considered medically significant, but admittedly, bites are actually underreported and there's not as much research as there probably should be on the way that these guys' venom works and the delivery system. Probably the burning question that people have is, have I ever been bitten by one? Yes, unfortunately. One time I did get bit and it was my fault. I had her rodent in my hand and I had opened up the glass of her enclosure just enough to put the rodent in and I had closed it again, on, like uh, kind of on the tail where there was just enough wiggle room for me to like jiggle the dead rat up and down. And I thought I was safe. I thought I had plenty of space and I was showing off for somebody being an idiot, you know, take it as a learning lesson. And I was jiggling the rat up and down and she missed the rat and there was apparently just enough of the glass open for her to actually fit her head out. And she took a right angle out of the enclosure and actually caught me on the tip of the finger. I was very lucky though, because it was just a, a tooth scrape. Like she just like, grazed my finger with one side of her upper jaw. It wasn't like a true bite, but I absolutely called a good friend of mine and I was like, hey, I just got bit by one of my false water cobras. Time to uh, see what happens. You know, time to see how this goes. He brought me lunch. We sat on the couch while I ate lunch. And to, to be honest with you, a little bit of dizziness, a little bit of lightheadedness, and a little bit of throbbing and swelling in the actual finger. But other than that, pretty insignificant uh, symptoms, I would say. And, and there's a very good reason for that too. There are studies online that suggest that their venom composition is similar to that of a timber rattlesnake, which is of course, that'd be pretty potent when you look at it at face value. Like that's a potent animal that you're comparing that venom to. You know, why aren't you using a tool while handling this chance? The delivery system pales in comparison. When you have a, a pit viper, and they have these huge hypodermic hinged fangs, those are basically hypodermic needles. And those, and those venom glands are pressurized upon bite. So they are injecting that venom directly into your bloodstream through a closed needle, essentially. It is a closed system. It is incredibly efficient at delivering that venom. These guys, their back teeth are essentially just a little bit bigger than normal teeth. And instead of being a fully enclosed like hypodermic needle, it's just a groove that runs down along the tooth. And so that venom, instead of being like actively injected in a very efficient manner in a very pure concentrate into the bloodstream of whatever it's biting, it kind of just dribbles down into their saliva and then mixes with you know, the saliva and the bite and the blood and whatever. Also, they don't have a lot of it. Like it's not nearly as they don't pump the quantities that a timber rattlesnake would. It's all still kind of hypothesis because at least the, the studies I have seen are a little bit more theoretical because there really has not been enough research done on the bite mechanics or the venom of these guys 
but it seems like the lack of concentration or the lack of efficient delivery system and the lack of overall amount of venom is what amounts to them not being considered uh, like medically significant when they bite somebody. But some of the reports have been um, partial and full paralysis for like up to half an hour and like some swelling and like all sorts of other irritation and like dizziness and vomiting and nausea and things like that. So it's not a bite that you wanna experience if you can avoid it. Not to mention, they're just got a strong bite too. Even if they weren't venomous, I would avoid getting bit by these guys because they, the mechanical damage of their bite is not pleasant. But as someone who has no outstanding allergies and, and has never had any negative reaction to venom, I weigh the risks and I also know my animals pretty well. And so I, I would never handle a cobra like this, like some people I know but I will absolutely handle false water cobras like this. The risk there is plenty mitigated and not high enough for it to be of, of a massive concern to me. It's really funny how I came to get into these species. They used to be not common at all in captivity. And now lately they've, like I said, they've hit this popularity trend. I've just seen so many posts and I've seen so many groups pop up about false water cobras and everyone's interested in keeping them because they are big, charismatic, intelligent snakes, and they make such rewarding keepers. You know, you want a snake that thinks, a snake that looks at you, a snake that you can see personality in. They've gotta be one of the smartest non-alapid snakes out there. The story of how I got into them is actually kind of funny. And it kind of makes me seem like a little bit of a dude, bro. It, I learned a lesson at the end. It's a heartwarming whole, you know, Disney scenario. I was actually at the Venomous Herpetology Symposium a few years ago down in Zoo Miami, and I was helping run a booth for my good friends at the Rattlesnake Conservancy. And we were just sitting there shooting the breeze at the booth, and we were talking about venomous keeping. And me and my, my youthful exuberance, I was like, you know, what is the most venomous snake that you can keep in captivity without a permit in Florida? And I didn't know what a false water cobra was. Well, my friend Derek was like, you know, if I had to say, it would probably be a false water cobra. And I was like, a what now? A what? A what's that? And he was like, a false water cobra. They're unregulated because they're just a, a non-medically significant colubrid, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a venomous snake that I wouldn't want to take a bite from. And I was like, well, that sounds really cool. And it turns out Zoo Miami had two of them. And so we took the moment to go to the herp house and check them out there. And I looked at them and I immediately thought they were like gorgeous. I looked at them, I was like, look at that big, strong body and the very intelligent face and just such, such a pretty animal. I loved the pattern, the way that it changed from the head to the body. And I was like, okay, you know what? That's a target species of mine. That's one that I wanna keep. And at the time, I just wanted to keep it because it was the most venomous thing that I could keep without a permit in Florida, which is a really, really, let me emphasize this. This is a really, really bad reason to wanna keep anything and I'm self-admitting that, that it was a stupid, egotistical reason to want to keep a snake. Oh yeah, I want the most venomous thing that I don't need a permit for. That's a very dude bro, stupid way of looking at it. But for better or worse, that is the way I was thinking at the time. Well, then I started doing my research because as much of a dude bro as I was, I was not about to jump into a snake I didn't do any research on. So I did research over the next six months. I did like some really in-depth research and was reaching out to people who, who had bred them and reaching out to people who had kept them before. And I found myself falling for this species that I had never kept. And then I finally found someone who was getting out of breeding them and he had one big female left. And I had a friend of mine who had had a male left that he didn't want anymore. I reached out to them, I acquired the pair. And let me tell you something, I have kept hundreds of species of snakes in my time. And I am not hesitating when I say that these guys absolutely captured my heart like no other snake ever has. These are my favorite species of snake to keep on the planet. There's other ways to qualify that statement, like what's your favorite snake? And that's a very hard question to answer. What I can definitively say is these are my favorite species of snake to keep on the face of the earth. They don't behave like any other snake too. They have like one of the wildest feeding responses I've ever seen. You know, you throw food in there. If you threw food in there, they would catch it before it hit the ground. They have one of the most active, powerful feeding responses I've ever seen in a snake. Sometimes that can make things tense because they, you know, you walk into a room and if they know that it's feeding day, they're, they're at the glass before you can ever get the glass open. So they are very, very active snakes. But at the same time, they're smart, so they're not particularly mean snakes. I've met some that have an attitude and some that have a temper, but because they're so intelligent, you can work with these snakes and you can really get them to the point where you can handle them. And of course they are venomous, so if you know that you're sensitive to other venoms and other you know, risks of anaphylaxis, then I would avoid handling these freely. I will say they're one of the poorest snakes to work with on a hook. I've ever, like they, they do not ride a hook well. 
They will handcuff your hook, they will handcuff your foot, they will handcuff everything, and they just really do not like to be worked with like a cobra would. I'm gonna say this with confidence, I've worked with cobras. They're much easier to work with than these guys are as far as like logistics go with tools. And it's always been very interesting to me to note that these guys have never seen a cobra. Cobras are, are old world, they're from Africa and, and uh, like the Middle East and Asia. These guys are not, these guys are from South America. Uh, old world technically means anything on the eastern side of the Atlantic Ocean. So Europe is old world, Asia's old world, World, Africa's old world. Technically, Australia is not. I found that out recently. In our last video where we found the indigo snake, I called possums. I called them old world. I had someone come up to me and go, you know, technically, if it's from Australia, it's not considered old world. If it's from Australia, it's from Australia. It's its own thing. Until someone comes to me and says, actually, you know, and I get that corrected too. But as far as I'm under in understanding now, old world is anything across the Atlantic that isn't Australia. And then new world is as it implies, North and South America. And it's obviously in reference to, uh, well, let's be honest, it's in reference to British colonialism. Wow. <laughs> it's in reference to Britain going and taking over. Cause, cause this world was definitely not new to the people who already lived here, Columbus, Oops. you know? You can find them in Southern Brazil. You can find them in certain bands of Argentina. You can find them in Bolivia and one of the Guays, Uruguay or Paraguay, I think it's Uruguay. Um, and so they, they really, they inhabit that like central Southern band across South South America. Whereas you would see a boa just kind of like cruise, like they were just like big head, no thoughts, kind of just like roll in a direction. You know, you see her look around, you see them like, God, they just think, man, they're the, this is the smartest snake I've ever worked with consistently. You know, because I've never been able to work with a king cobra, which of course is probably the smartest snake on the planet. But these are the smartest snakes that I've worked with with any sort of regularity. They have more object permanence than I've seen in other snakes. You know, if you put the rat around the corner, they seem to know, not just by scent, but they seem to know like that that rat is still around the corner. Whereas another snake is like, oh, out of sight, doesn't exist, you know? They make eye contact with you, which of course we as humans, anything that's visual like us, we tend to impart more intelligence onto, like we, we, we project that. We're like, oh, it's looking at me. So it's smarter than, you know, something that does which of course is our anthrocentric mindset. You can't help but have them look at you and look around and look at the situation and, and they pick up on patterns. They're just, they're, there's just so much going on up there for a snake. That being said, they make really rewarding pet snakes because they do make fantastic snakes. They, they require a lot of space because they are a very big active snake, but they don't require a lot of the other things that sometimes make snakes a pain in the butt to keep. Their ambient temperature is like room temperature and their hotspot, I never let their hotspot get over like 90 degrees. Like their hotspot somewhere hovers somewhere in like the middle eighties to the upper eighties and it fluctuates too. I let them experience the seasons and they, I've found that when you give them too much heat, they actually avoid it. Their digestion is clean and efficient. You don't have to worry about digestion problems from not enough heat. You never really have to worry about one having a bad appetite. If it's got a bad appetite, there actually is something wrong with it because unlike a ball python that'll just go off of food, these guys are dedicated weekly feeders. There's not much that they won't eat any time of day. They are incredibly opportunistic. They will eat rodents, they will eat fish, they will eat amphibians, they will eat birds, they will eat lizards, they will eat other snakes. They will eat just about anything that they can overpower and get a hold of. They are incredibly opportunistic, which also makes them very fun keepers. They do get big, obviously. She's uh, pretty much full grown, and I'd put her probably somewhere in like the little over six foot range, maybe, end to end. Like if I get her all stretched out, you can see. Some of the biggest ones I've ever heard heard of have been like pushing that like seven and a half foot range. There's claims that they can get up to like nine or 10 feet, citation needed. You know, I would need to see that in person to believe it. Typically speaking, you'll see a full grown adult somewhere in that six foot, seven foot range. And they're a weighty stake, man. They are definitely a handful. They definitely need a water source they can get all the way into, but it shouldn't be like half of their enclosure. They do benefit from UVB, just like every other snake, in my opinion. So if you can provide it to them, you will notice better activity levels. You'll notice better immune system. You'll notice all those things. Breeding them, shockingly easy. You know, if you can, the hardest part about breeding them is actually working with a snake this big. If you can get over that aspect, breeding them is no more complicated than breeding, you know, corn snakes. Except that you do kind of have to keep an eye on your female. Females are a lot bigger than the males. And so if you introduce them at an inopportune time, she might be a little on the hungry side and she might decide Romeo is a meal instead of a boyfriend. They produce huge babies and huge eggs. Babies come out like almost a foot long already. 
which is awesome. Very easy to feed, very easy to get started. Most of the ones I've produced have always gone straight to rodents. Not a problem. I've had one or two picky eaters in the past. I feel like I sound like a broken record. It's, it's so hard to, to quantify my love for this animal, but like this is, everyone's got a passion species. You hear people say, you know, and I think everyone should. I think everyone should have a passion species because if we as a hobby can come together and Noah's Ark this thing, like if everyone picked one oddball thing, that they were an expert on, that they could breed, that they could keep you know, genetically alive in captivity, we wouldn't need importing. With how many hobbyists there are out there, if each one of us could pick something cool and make sure that we could propagate it in captivity, we could take this strain off of our native ecosystems by a hundredfold. And I will keep false water cobras for the rest of my life. There'll never be a time that I don't have these snakes. And I just wanted to give them a showcase today because they're still a mysterious snake. Like not a lot of people have even heard of them. I wanted to be that hipster who showed that I had them before they got really, really, really popular. Thanks so much guys for listening to me rant about my favorite snake species. And let me know if you guys want to know anything more about these guys, you know, more in depth care guide or, or some of the more details about them. Just, just anything you're curious about, be sure to leave a comment or, or uh, inbox us. And please be sure as always to like and subscribe. That kind of support is what allows me to keep making these informational videos. Um, so as always, thank you guys for your support so much. It means the world to us. Um, yeah. See you next time. Oh yeah, uh, see you guys next time. <laughs>